Hi, everyone. Uh, just a disclaimer, I had a presentation this morning about actually the other title, uh, what's next for DeFi in terms of uh, yield farming and everything. There will be a, a bit of overlap with this presentation, um, but this one is more focused on building those derivatives and how to make that for DeFi. So my name is Gaspar Peluzzi. I'm a co-founder of AP1 Protocol. Um, I have a computer science background, and uh, in 2020, surfing in the DeFi summer, we were thinking with a group of friends that um, we must bu build some tool to be able to edge or speculate on the variation of those interest rates because they are crazy volatile and cannot be arbitraged more than moving liquidity directly there. Um, so, who in who there use DeFi on a regular basis, approximately? I let you, up to you say what's regular. Okay, and who would use DeFi, but like? who is using DeFi on a regular basis, but apart from liquidity provision. Okay. Um, Clicker is not working, I think. That was my only slide. Oh, no, actually. So, thank you. Um, yeah. So, big question here is, is uh, DeFi organic? Um, like, uh, compared to the volume and liquidity, what is this liquidity used for? And uh, that's a big question because a lot of criticism that we have usually is uh, DeFi is just for yield farming and you don't have real usage. And when you look at those protocol that seems to be used for real usage, looking at how the liquidity is actually used a few steps away is actually usually for yield farming. Um, so the question is actually a very legit one. The purpose of this talk is to say that um, to make DeFi used, uh, we need to be, it's still not working though. Okay, and just delays. We need to make it practicable. Practicable in terms of interest rates. We had a lot of, uh, whether or not you're in DeFi, whether or not you're in TradFi, we had so many news about interest rates uh, in the last year. So many things with banks. I'll actually go through different use cases and like uh, concrete cases. But even in DeFi, we had extremely volatile of interest rates. I mean, like imagine that you're borrowing USDC at 2% and someday it jump, um, it jump up to 80%. It's crazy volatile and you cannot have uh, that kind of volatility if you're actually intending to use that finance in an organic way because those costs need to be controlled and you need to have more certainty about the revenues as well. And that's where interest rate derivatives come into play. Interest rate derivatives, uh, when we explain what we're doing to people, uh, they think it's very niche. But it's actually not niche, it's actually at the roots of finance because interest rates is the time value of money, the price of liquidity. And every DeFi protocol needs liquidity to function. Every business is handle the cash flow in a way that can make their activity profitable. That's the basis of finance. Uh, most of the big companies use, on a daily basis, interest rate derivatives to be able to do what they do. You, when you take, go to a bank and do, for example, a loan at a fixed rate, eventually somewhere else there will be interest rate derivatives involved. And that's needed because you are evolving in an economy where interest rates are going and you need to edge yourself against those. And the same with DeFi occurs. You need liquidity for some things, you need to be able to control those costs. What is interest rate derivatives? It's basically instruments that allows you to manipulate the value of, uh, like the, the value change of interest rates. It can be options, swaps, futures, you may have heard of bonds, for example. Like all those are instruments you can use. And they are basically two sides. Either you can speculate, Volatility means interest for traders. You can speculate on those variations. It's very volatile. Or you can edge yourself against those because you're just a passive user and you want to take a loan and you don't want to get exposed to that. Or you want to control your revenues as well because based on that, uh, you can control your activity. It's the biggest market in traditional finance. Um, a case study. Um, we maybe, a lot of us had a cold, uh, uh, like a cold times during a weekend where we were thinking that maybe USDC was depegged. Not necessarily because you had USDC, but also because maybe you were exposed to something that had USDC. And eventually the dominoes effect, the contagion is pretty high. And that contagion initially happened because one bank was uh, defaulting. And why was it defaulting? Because that bank invested in bonds where the maturity was uh, in average too long compared to their liquidity need. So to decompose a bit that, a treasury bond is basically a dollar that you buy that is locked until an expiry. So a dollar that you will have be, able, be able to have at an expiry. So it can be three months, 
six months, way longer. And the longer, the longer, the, the most far the expiry is, the biggest the discount on the dollar is, because that basically represents an opportunity cost on what you can do with that liquidity. And so you can buy bonds, sell bonds. And bonds are like the basis, the most basic instrument treasury bond of the whole economy. It's a bit like stake is, for example. Like uh, if, if, if you're building a protocol that uh, gives you an IPY and is that is less than what you can have with uh, Ethereum staking, it's probably not very profitable because that's the basic activity that you can have. Same thing with treasure bonds. So that's something that banks, for example, invest a lot their liquidity on. And of course, when a lot of people uh, want the liquidity back, either they have the liquidity available or they need to sell those bonds back. And given that interest rates rose a lot, they were selling those bonds at an inferior price than what they had initially, and so hence the loss and the default. And so that replicated into circle, not having the liquidity, maybe, for the USDC and then the whole economy. So the domino effect of interest rate is huge, and I think this year was a great example for that. You can also have uh, happy cases with interest rates. For example, uh, Tether, they made a lot of money investing in short-term bonds. They didn't have a liquidity issue, and then they made a lot of profit from that. And the example that I showed initially with the bank that shorted interest rates, they also made almost $4 billion, uh, doing that. OK, the slides are a bit, uh, a bit weird, but um, now DeFi. How do we do that to DeFi? Because it's great to have treasury bonds in traditional finance, but we want to have those products for DeFi protocols, for all our pools on lots of different assets, and we need to have that in permissionless way. So with time came standard, like for 626, uh, the vault standard, when, which can be defined as a layer on top of which you can build derivatives. And that's basically what we did uh, two years ago with APOIN. We said, well, if we have an interest bearing asset, we can basically split it in two. We set an expiry, and we set the principal from the yield again. And then the principal is basically, basically a bond, is the locked underlying that you deposited until the expiry, and the yield token on the other way around is actually all the yield that will be generated by this interest bearing token and that the holder can redeem progressively. It's very simple, but with the V2 that we built, you can do that on a permissionless way, so anyone can select an interest bearing token, select a duration, and tokenize, and create a pool for that, and so people can create bonds and trade yield independently. Once you have that, you can build very simple products, not crazy derivatives, but also just fixed income products. People can now buy locked ETH until a fixed duration. We had um, like with a lot of food with the stake ETH and the withdrawing queue and everything. We actually had a discount during some times on the stake ETH because people were speculating, well, I prefer to sell my stake ETH at a discount because I don't know when I will be able to get it back. Well, bonds are operating more or less the same way. It's also extremely good collaterals because for a lot of uh, protocols that need liquidity at an expiry, they can do just like the banks in the previous example. They can buy asset at the discount because it will be unlocked at a defined expiry. So that's fixed, fixed income product. Because you sell yield and we created a layer two marketplace for that, meaning that actually you're generating interest on Aave. Let's say you deposited a million dollar on Aave. You have a quite irregular uh, revenues because of that. You can say, well, actually, I need to use the yield already now. I will sell Q1 and Q2 of my future yield. You go in the yield marketplace, and if you click, you can sell your interest, your future interest over two quarters, for example, just one click. Sorry. That's selling in advance, fixing, fi basically know what you earn kind of paradigm. That makes the ecosystem as a well whole way more practicable, because then you have also the other side. You want to take a loan. You think the interest rate will go in, like, will stay between a margin, but you cannot afford to have, for example, a liquidity crisis and interest rate, interest rate going way too up, and then your position gets liquidated and everything. So that's also something that building a layer of derivatives on top of existing lending market, we can bring this primitive, tokenize it, creating a marketplace for it, and then people can, can trade directly to interest. And so you, as a borrower, you can actually have fixed rate lending in a way more efficient and permissionless manner, which you cannot do if you integrate that at the lowest level, like Ave is doing, for example. So we build on top of Ave. And then eventually, that's how interest rate derivatives are progressively making the ecosystem more efficient. Why? Because if you look at Ave, for example, again, you have a huge spread between lending and borrowers. Then you have another protocol coming on top, Marfo, doing peer-to-peer -peer matching. Then you don't have any spread. 
And then you have APY being, being built on top of Morpho that allows you to trade those interest rates and to fix them, swapping variable against fixed, whether you're a lender or borrower. And that allows also to do a lot of market arbitrage. Uh, because uh, a lot of time you, you can see on different uh, LSDs, on different protocols, for the same asset you have very, like a lot of variation between interest rates. And those derivatives also allows you to take leverage exposure on those, so reduce, like improving the arbitrage by quite an important factor. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. As I mentioned, we, so AP1 is, exists since 2020. Uh, we worked on the V2 since uh, 1.5 year. Um, and that will allow you, it will be fully open this month. I can already invite, um, send a bit of invite to anyone that wants some. And uh, you can integrate that into any protocols, any pools, in a very, very easy and permissionless way. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. I have just uh, quick questions about the users. Actually, how are you thinking about who is going to use it? Because even the base plain vanilla swaps for interest rates are basically used by institutional investors, right? I mean, it's usually, you know, interbank uh, transactions. And this just like feel more like, you know, retail usage. So how are you thinking about like, you know, your customers and and what is the overall traction of the, you know, of the project? Thanks. So do you mean how do we get institutions or? Like no, I mean, uh, who is actually going yeah. to y use it, you know, because uh, for institutional investors, they already have solution, right? They use it on a daily basis. So if you want to have institutional crypto investors, um, yeah, I, I just uh, I, I'm just like trying to figure out what is the market, how big mm -hmm. is the market, and who is actually going to use it, because it seems I don't know, from outside a bit complicated, and I think in the TradFi world you already have solution for that. So I'm just like you know trying to figure out like, of course, you know. There, thank you very much for the question. There are actually two as two aspects, uh, two different answer to that. The first one in terms of current user base. Uh, it's also a question for the whole DeFi, right? Like who is currently using DeFi and the current uh, tools that you have available there. Fixed income products are actually very simple by their use. Uh, even without having those protocol existing for that people who are making speculation as I uh, explained, for example, for stake ease. So those products are very easy to, to be used. But the current retail DeFi user base that has a very, a very diverse spectrum of financial knowledge and necessarily like a very advanced one uh, still, for those user category, we're building those simple interface, simple product. Uh, we already had interest for that in the V1. We currently have, like, it's, it's easier to have it now. But it's mostly, let's say, bonds and people that want to speculate a bit on the version of those interest rates. And that's like, even the case with the current user base. Now there are, like, two different other users. The protocols. Most of the liquidity, usually, of DeFi protocols come from other DeFi protocols. And that's the same with AP Wine. Uh, those derivatives, they make extremely good collaterals. That's why we choose the tokenization approach and the layer approach. So we prefer to be at a lower level and be integrated as collateral in another protocol. So that's uh, another answer. And bringing the, the, the two first in, into perspective, um, once you have actually have those, all those layers of protocols and once you have interest rate derivatives, that's where you start to be efficient. That's where you start to be efficient and even really more efficient than TradFi, and that's where you can have those other actors. And the current challenge for DeFi, in my opinion, is actually to be relevant for those people that can have access to maybe product with higher efficiency. But that comes with different layers, different products, and it's, it's not just a liquidity issue because, uh, uh, you know, if you have li less liquidity to handle, it's actually easier to make it efficient in some ways. Uh, so, so it's not just a liquidity issue, it's, it's that layer approach where you have more for, because even for institutional actors, why would you want to play with a lending market that have like one person spread between lending and borrowing? That's, that's huge, that doesn't exist in traditional finance. So you need those, those products to arrive and interest rate derivatives, I think in my opinion, are the next step to make the ecosystem more practicable, more practicable because you can actually have control over what you earn and what you spend. Um, that was like very, easy to understand concept, but imagine that's what's make it yeah, practicable for the bigger sectors as well. So still today, a lot of DeFi is not organic, but interest rate derivatives will make it so.
All right. Thank you. Thank you.